And now, a look at Tyrants of the Underdark. We would like to thank Gale Force 9 for providing us with a review copy of this game. Tyrants of the Underdark was designed by Peter Lee, Rodney Thompson, and Andrew Bean. Features artwork from Steve Ellis. In North America, this one was published in 2016 by Gale Force 9 under license from Wizards of the Coast. Uh, this is a mashup of deck building and board game that plays two to four players with games taking about an hour to an hour and a half depending on the player count. For a look at what you get, be sure to check out our Tyrants of the Underdark unboxing video on YouTube. Now, in regard to physical components, everything here is very well produced. You got solid boards, cool little assassin minis, uh, serviceable generic units uh, that are little shields, some tokens, and lots and lots of cards. I get into the details of what you get over on the blog. I don't think it's worth covering everything here. Now, to start a game of Tyrants of the Underdark, you're going to put out the board, which shows an abstract map of the Underdark with boxes representing locations and large circles, nine of them representing drow cities, and there's white routes connecting them. Each of these has a various, varying number of slots for placing units in just little round spots on the map. You start by filling some of the slots on the board with neutral units. These are a little light gray. And then every player is going to pick one of the locations. No, not the cities. One of the locations as a starting base. And they claim one of the spots on there with one of their units. This is a pretty traditional deck building game. So everyone starts off with an identical set of 10 cards, which comprised of three soldiers and seven nobles. They're going to shuffle their cards and draw half of these. The card market is created by taking two what they call half decks. So this is something unique to Tyrants of the Underdark I hadn't seen in another game before. The game comes with four of these, and what you do is you're going to pick two of the four half decks and shuffle them together to make the market. From this combined deck, you're going to deal six cards face up, so you're looking at a variable market like in games like Star Realms or Ascension. You're also going to have a set of standard cards that are always available. Uh, again, think Star Realms or Ascension or Clank. Well, so your standard deck builder, starting with that, uh, starting that most experienced listeners will be immediately familiar with. Yeah, this is, is very much starts off, at least as a traditional deck building game. Now, each turn, you're going to play your hand of cards in any order you choose. Your initial cards, your, your soldiers and your um, nobles, are going to produce one of two resources, either influence or power. And I'm sure you can guess which produces which. Influence is used to buy new cards from the market. That's your money. Purchase cards are placed directly into a player's discard pile. Power, though, is the where this starts deviating from most deck building games. Power is what's used to interact with the board. One point of power lets you place a new troop out on the board where you have presence, which means one of your troops is there or it's next to somewhere where you have a troop. With three power, you can get rid of an opponent's spy, a bit more about them in a bit, or assassinate a troop that's out there. Assassinated troops are taken from the board and placed into the assassinating player's trophy area. And you are going to get points at the end of the game for everyone you've assassinated. Remember, you are playing Dark Elves in this game. If at any point a player has majority control of one of the Drow cities, again, these are the bigger round spots on the board, you're going to take a control token. This gives you more influence. And again, influence is what you use to buy more cards. Filling every spot on a city. So if a city has, say, six spots, having the majority of people in there. So you have two people in there, no one else is there, you get control. If you fill all six spots, you get total control. This actually lets you flip that control marker over, and you start earning victory points every turn you're able to keep the city under total control. Additionally, at the end of the game, every spot on the board, every location has a number next to it, a value. Every location you control is going to give you points at the end of the game, and you're going to get bonus points for having complete control of locations. So, aside from the very strange fact that we are mashing area control and deck builder into a single game, mm -hmm. none of the actual territory we're, we're treading here is new. It's very bog standard deck builder and standard deck uh, area control, really. Yeah, pretty much. I, without the combat, from most area control games. So what you're not going to find here is your risk rolling looking for sixes. Instead, you're going to be playing cards using that power to instantly eliminate troops. There's no random factor here, except for the cards you draw, of course. Now, cards purchased from the market 
are going to give you usually some influence or power. So those are your two main main resources in the game. But many of them will also have additional abilities. Now, I'm not going to get into how each of these work or the exact names of them here. I don't think it's worth it. Um, but they're going to let you do things like place spies, remove already placed spies to get something, assassinate troops automatically, um, move troops on the board, Displace troops, which is you actually supplant, you replace an opponent's troop with one of your own, um, manipulate the card market, devour cards, the dragons tend to like to devour things for some reason, which actually removes cards from the game, and more. Now, one particular ability that I do want to mention that is unique to this game is an ability called Promote, and this is something that fits the theme really well. This is an ability that allows you to promote the cards you have in your deck into what's called your inner circle, which is physically just a, a board that you put them on that happens to be round, but it represents your drow household promoting people from within. Now, at the end of the game, every card you've collected in all your deck, every card you've got, everything in your discard pile is worth points, but cards in your inner circle are worth more. So it sounds like that's going to be your only main, if not only, deck reduction mechanic for mm -hmm. your deck builder. But you need to balance ridding yourself of good cards, which will be worth more in your inner circle, versus just dumping the junk and get, making yes. your deck a tighter uh, deck builder. Yeah, and this is actually the only deck re reduction mechanic. It's, it's, it's a privately controlled only if you get promotion cards. Now, it is worth noting, again, your original cards can't do this. You will have to purchase a card from the market that lets you promote. Now, there are a number of them, and again, we talked about those half decks. Some of the half decks have more promotion cards in them than others. The dragon deck, not so many. The drow deck, lots of them. Now, play continues, uh, going around the table, playing your cards, putting out stuff on the map, manipulating things until someone runs out of units, um, or the market deck runs out. Now, note, in all the games I played, we never had the market deck run out. Always someone plays their last unit, and that triggers the game end. Now, as mentioned already, you're going to get points for the cards you've collected, uh, including the cards in your deck and your, your cards you promoted, your areas you control on the map with bonus points for total control, uh, victory tokens you've collected, that's for controlling the cities, which I mentioned earlier, for each enemy troop you've killed and the trophy hall as well. At the end of the game, player with the most points wins. Well, that's certainly easy enough to pick the winner. <laughs> now, as for my feelings on this drow-themed game, after just one play, like just the first time I played this game, I was wowed. I was like, wow, this is one of the best deck building games I played. Now, since then, like I, if you go on the blog, there's a review I wrote then. Like this is one of those ones I, I don't often do a first thoughts review. I was so excited about this game. I had to write about it right away. Now, since then, I played this game many times and my thoughts haven't changed. This is a fantastic deck builder. But it's more than that. It's also a really solid area control game. I like this Dungeons and Dragons themed game. The designers managed to take two very different styles of games. Games that for years have stood alone on their own and mash them together and make something that's more than the individual parts. Some of the things that I think really stand out about Tyrants of the Underdark include the following. For one, the whole half deck thing is great for making the market interesting. Every other deck builder I play, you just play with the whole deck and maybe you buy expansions and you throw them in the deck and the deck just gets builder, bigger. By including four different half decks, only two of which you use each game, you end up with six possible different markets right out of the box. Now, in addition, there's an expansion pack out there with two more decks, which ups that to 15 different possible decks. And each deck is designed to have its own unique twist. I already kind of mentioned the dragon deck and the drow deck. Well, the demon deck, you have these sacrifices that you want to feed to the demons and having them in your deck stinks because they're worth minus points if you have any sacrifices left. Because how dare you have sacrifices and not actually send them to the demons? Like, they did a really good job of making each deck feel unique. The next thing I really dig is that promotion system, that whole way to purge cards from your deck and put it into your inner circle. And what's really interesting, and the first time I played this game, I hadn't played Tante Koro, which is a Japanese made theme deck building game that actually has a really similar mechanic called chambering. And I, this uses that mechanic, but in my opinion, even better. What I like the most here is what Sean mentioned earlier is the decision, the hard choice of I've got an eight cost dragon that instantly kills two troops and gives me seven power. And every time he comes up in my deck, I can do a ton of stuff. 
but if I promote him, he's worth 10 victory points. And that decision on when to promote that dragon or do you keep it in your deck or not? Or do I just try to wean out all the, the, the garbage cards? Do I get rid of all my swords and nobles? Which makes your deck a little thinner, but they're only worth one point each, right? Like, I love that decision point. Other thing I like is how spies work. So every player in Tyrants of the Dark gets five little spy miniatures, which are actually kind of cool looking, but no way to use them at the start of the game. Now, once you play the game once, you're going to see how this works. And the way it works is you're going to find cards that are spy cards. And every single spy card in the game does two things. First, it lets you place a spy at any location on the board. Now, this on its own is super powerful because you can only place units where you have presence. Well, placing a spy gives you presence. So all of a sudden, your army's all on the left side of the board. You suddenly throw a spy on the right side of the board. You now have presence there, and all of a sudden, your units start showing up over there, right? Now, second, each card with a spy ability has a second ability that goes off if you take back one of your spies. So this, these tend to be really powerful, often generating lots of power influence, usually like three or four power, three or four influence, or letting you um, supplant or assassinate multiple troops at once. Now, what this means in play is that every spy action is actually a two-step process. The first is using a card to build your spy network and then using another card or the same card if you cycle through your deck to actually put that spy network to use, which leads me to the other thing that I think has probably already been pretty clear in this review is how well the mechanics tie to that drow theme, that dark elf conniving, stabbing in the back, underhanded spy filled society. I am always impressed by how well this makes me feel like I'm controlling a drow family. Well, some of this comes from the artwork and the flavor text, like it's all there, but really that's kind of pasted on. It's the actual gameplay, like the promotion system. That is so fitting with drow society, deciding who to promote and when to promote, as well as that use of spies to spread your control and the feeling of building a spy network and how one house could win just by having the best spy network is again fits. The fact that you're not, killing the opponent's troops they're going to combat you're assassinating and you're supplanting troops all of this fits that D, &D drow theme perfectly and and given my thoughts on some certain other D, &D board <laughs> themed board games i have to count this as a huge plus uh unlike others this isn't just a uh, D, D paint job on a euro with some flavor text to make it licensed yeah i was wondering if you were going to call out that game I, I i know your opinions on that game and we'll leave it as the game that shall not be mentioned tonight but yes there this this does D, &D right in a way at least this aspect of D, &D this right. the, the drow aspect and like i said just even the way like the dragon cards work or the way the demon deck plays different than the drow deck oh it's really well done for like I, you don't expect it from the game until you start thinking about why things are working and like the, even the way the spies work well why can i only place this fire take one away well you got to build the network before you can use it right like right. I, even that's thematic now, i gotta say despite all this praise the game isn't perfect um my main complaint is the look of the game the aesthetic uh, it's just too dark and and samey and everything's kind of bland uh, the player colors are even bland and hard to tell apart. The player boards are only separated by a player color, a bar of color. The orange and the red, even not having color blindness problems, are very close together. And then the other two colors are dark blue and black. Um, the entire thing's just drab. And the board, I really don't like. Like, it's this actually, like, this game's been out for a long time and I didn't play it for years because it just looked like a game of risk. Like, it just, nothing about that board with little shields on it draws me in at all now i get it it's it's under dark it should be dark and blues and purples and but i, I don't know they could have done something to make it pop a little more than they did with this one yeah one of the major advantages of warhammer's dark elves over D, &D drow you get a much better color palette palette in warhammer <laughs> Go. but even sticking to the dark color, i don't know throw something on there to, to, to just make it stick out a little more maybe worry a little less about the aesthetics and a little bit more on the mechanics i don't know I, I, it could have been used to be improved now the other issues we found while playing tyrants in the other dark um are just the, the generic deck building problems like the reason there are people out there that don't like deck builders uh the randomness of the market can mean that some players are presented with better options than others I, I hate that feeling of there's nothing to buy. I buy something I don't really want. And then this great card comes up for the next player. 
which is frustrating when it happens once, but when it happens on your turn four times in a row, you get a little frustrated. Also, it does have the thing where higher cost cards tend to be better than lower price cards. And it's often the case that you're just going to buy whatever you can afford. So you sit there and go, oh, I got eight influence. I look over, what's the highest cost card? Oh, there's a six. Okay, let me see the six. Yep, I'll buy that. I got two left. Okay, let me see the two twos. I buy this two. And not even worry about the rest of the cards up there. That is definitely a case in this game. Um, I wouldn't say it's as bad as Ascension, which I personally find is the game that's the worst for it kind of plays itself. There are at least you'll pro usually have multiple sixes up to choose from. Um, but that is definitely a thing. Uh, and it is mitigated a bit by the way certain cards combo together. Like you could definitely try to work on a promotion strategy. So if you're working on a promotion strategy, you might want that four promotion card over that six dragon because you want promotion cards. Same thing with like spy networks. If you're trying to do the spy network thing, you're probably going to favor spy cards over possibly higher cost cards that say move troops. So there is a little bit of that offset, but like it's still there. It's still a deck builder. It's going to have all the problems that pretty much every deck builder ever published is going to have. Now, is there a way to wipe or recycle the market? I know that's a mechanic that some deck builders are often integrating now to try and reduce the impact of that bad market on, on gameplay. Uh, there are cards that devour cards in the market where you just remove them from play, but that's it. So if no one buys those cards, there really aren't. And as far as I know, they're only in the dragon deck. So only if you're using that half deck, does that even come up? Okay. So there is no like wipe it. There's no choose to buy nothing and it wipes or it's been the same for three turns it wipes. Um, though I don't remember ever sitting there and being like the market's terrible. Like I've never had it like say in Star Realms where every ship costs six or higher and you just at the beginning of the game don't have that kind of influence. Yep. The, the distribution seems to be a little better um, on that. I think the highest cost cards are only seven and it's pretty easy to get influence. Like I say you start with seven of the nobles so right. you can start easily getting five your first turn of the game or your second turn of the game and quickly if you start buying priestesses they give two influence when they only cost two so it's getting that income is quick though it's a bit of a trap in this game because if you spend two minutes cards getting influence you're not going to get to influence the board because you won't have enough power so that's an aspect of gameplay you don't see in other deck builders right all right overall Tyrants of the Underdark is not only one of the best deck gilding games I've played and one of the better area majority games I own. It's just one of the best board games in my collection. I have enjoyed every single game I played of Tyrants of the Underdark. I have never had a bad experience playing this game and I don't expect that to change anytime soon. While I do kind of wish the game had a bit of a visual up, I have complaints about the actual gameplay. And I am still, every time I play, is shocked by just how thematic it is and how I actually get that feel of running a drow household. If you're a deck building fan and you don't own Tyrants of the Underdark, just go pick this up, fix that, go get it. If, if you like deck building even just a bit, you're gonna like this. If you like folk on a map, area majority games, I think it's worth checking out. Uh, it's going to be very different from your dice-based risk or your card-driven commanding color style games, right? Or even your um, area majority Twilight Struggles, right? This is a very different feel to that uh style of game if you're a DD &D fan looking for a surprisingly thematic board game experience that lets you take on the role of a drow household check this game out and heck if you're none of these things you should still try tyrants of the underdark it is a really good game it is one of the best games i own and i there i'm sure those people out there don't enjoy this one but i think they're going to be few and far between well, for a somewhat more in-depth look, although perhaps not as excitable, look <laughs> at Tyrants of the Underdark, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.